Well, welcome College of Eastern Idaho and the community, anybody who is tuning in to the President's Friday Forum, um, where once again, I am not President Amon, in case any of you are wondering. Uh, President Amon is on an accreditation visit, and I once again have the privilege of hosting the Friday Forum. So today, it's going to be a very exciting discussion. We have some faculty members here, and I very much appreciate them taking time out of their busy schedule to be with us today. We are going to discuss our new robot overlord, ChatGPT. Uh, so again, very excited for this discussion. As a disclaimer, I just want to say that none of us in the meeting today or in the discussion today are tech experts, and we are certainly not chat GPT experts. Uh, really, how could we be? It launched in November of 2022 and has taken the world by storm. And as I last checked, there have been over 100 million users, yes, 100 million, who have logged on to ChatGPT since it launched in December of 2020, I'm sorry, November of 2022. So I'm gonna let each guest introduce themselves and then we will move right on to the discussion. So Dana, do you wanna take the lead and just tell us a little bit about yourself? Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me, Lori. Uh, my name is Dana Cotton. I am the department chair for English, communications and humanities here at CEI. And I'm also a faculty member I've been a practitioner for over 20 years. So I've seen a lot of change uh, in technology over the years um, in both uh, high school setting and for most of my career, higher education and now at the College of Eastern Idaho. So I'm super happy to engage in this conversation. Um, like we have talked about many times, it is just the beginning. We will continue to talk about it as it rapidly changes every day. So I'm excited. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dana. And yes, I, I, I do want to say that this is just the beginning of this conversation um, at CEI. There is so much to think about and talk about and figure out as we move forward. So Heidi, do you want to introduce yourself? Absolutely. I'm a faculty member of Dana's department, English, Humanities and Communication. And I'm very excited about, about this dialogue and this conversation. ChatGPT is, it's exciting and a little bit overwhelming, and this is going to be awesome. Thank you so much, Heidi uh, and Sherston. Hi, my name is Sherston Erickson, and it says Kirsten on your screen, and I do know how to spell my name, but that it is what it is. Um, my, I am the department chair of nursing, and I am my history is I've been an ear, I was an ear nurse for about 20 years and then moved into education and love education just as much as I love nursing. So it's been nice to marry the two. Um, and yeah, chat GPT has taken me by storm. I have learned all sorts of new things that I did not know could happen. And like some of them are really exciting and some of them are maybe a little less exciting, but all interesting. All right. Well, again, thank you to all three of you. I know this is a really busy time of year. It's the last week, what, couple, last couple of weeks of semester, finals, pinnings, graduation, all of that pending. So um, I appreciate you taking time to have this discussion for us to start this dialogue on our campus. So before we launch into the questions, just a little bit, a tiny little background. Maybe a lot of you know the background of AI, uh, but just for the general listener who might not uh, it's not a new term, AI. The term was first coined in 1956 by an American computer scientist, John McCarthy. Um, and he had, was following up on the work of Alan, Alan Turing, um, who really is considered the father of artificial intelligence. And Turing described the existence of intelligent reasoning that could go into a machine. He was kind of imagining how that might work. And a current definition of AI is, quote, computing systems that are able to engage in human-like processes, such as learning, adapting, synthesizing, self-correction, and the use of data for complex processing tasks. So with that little bit of an introduction, I do want to launch into some questions that I sent out to um, these faculty members. So can you guys talk about what you've already seen in the classroom and how ChatGPT is beginning to transform what's going on in the classroom. And Dana, let's just start with you. I'm afraid my response isn't going to be too exciting. I can't say that I've seen anything transforming the classroom yet. Um, I think, you know, the buzz is about the potential 
transformations that that we will um, most definitely see. But I do um, definitely see faculty members utilizing it in their classrooms, Heidi being one of those faculty members, and um, a few others in our department um, looking at and analyzing the language that um, AI does generate. And so it's it's very interesting, but I haven't seen any transformations yet. Thank you. Heidi or Shearston, do you want to jump in? Uh, yeah, that would be that would be awesome. I think the biggest transformation that we're going to see is the transformation from incoming students because I have friends in education all across the spectrum. And what I'm seeing is that high school teachers are really embracing chat GPT and they're making it the subject of senior projects they're making it the subject of final discussions they're making it sometimes the, the subject of the entire semester. And so while I am seeing students use it in my classrooms, I what I expect to see is that the incoming crop of freshmen and especially the next crop of freshmen are going to be very proficient in chat DPT and they're going, they're going to be using it uh, with or without the guidance that we provide. And I think that's part of what makes starting this dialogue now so exciting and, and so important. Thanks, Heidi. Shearston? So, we haven't really begun to, yet to delve into how to bring about its good points and use this because I think it's a tool. And I think that's just how I think of it. And I think I'd like us to think of it as a tool. And like all tools, it can be used for really, really good positive things. And then like a lot of tools, it can also be used for not so positive things. So I think in nursing, we're, we're just barely starting the dialogue on how do we do the positive things and avoid the things that aren't positive. Um, like, I, I think it's awesome that they're using it in, in the high schools and that they're using it as a tool. And hopefully the message is also getting across in the high schools that there is a time and a place to use this. Um, but, you know, teaching that, that, you know, that the code of, I mean, the academic integrity ethics part of it is something that obviously we have to incorporate. And, you know, if, if you're going to use it, if we choose to use it, do we have them cite it so that they, um, you know, just like we would cite any other source, do we, can we make clear that, and it would be nice if they could do this in, in like, again, the, the, the high schools as well, that, you know, if, unless you're told that this is a tool that you can use, you don't use this tool. Um, but it is, it is going to be a tool that I think we need to embrace whether we want to or not, because it just is and it should be fun to see the good things that come of it too yeah so so thank you ladies and you know it's really interesting because sam altman who is the founder of uh chat gpt uh, of course when it first came out there, there's been quite a evolution of even higher education um higher education's response to chat gpt from november to now i kind of have read um, a progressive dialogue that's happened. And at first it was like, we absolutely have to ban this. We can't use this. And Sam Altman in, Janu in January said, generative text is something we all need to adapt to. Um, we adapted to calculators and changed what we tested for in math class, I imagine. This is a more extreme version of that, no doubt, but also the benefits are more extreme as well. So to build on what you just said, Shearston, um, you know, it, it, would, would you consider if somebody was using chat GPT, is that cheating in the classroom? Um, what, what methods do you guys already have to, I, I hate to, to, to use this term, but to quote, catch cheating? And um, have, you even, have you in your departments begun talking about, it, would chat GPT be cheating? So just anybody who wants to jump in on that. So I have some feelings. Um, again, I, I think... And I, I, I mean, I pretty much express them. If, if you're going to use it as a tool, you have to have permission and you have to cite it. And if you don't, I do think it's academic dishonesty. You are, you are, if you're presenting work as your own that is generated by someone else, whether it's another person or an AI, it's still not your work. And there are gonna be a lot of times when a lot of situations where that's okay. And like, honestly, the workforce is just going to evolve to, to 
incorporate chat GPT in all sorts of ways that I have no idea of. So it, we can't, even if we wanted to turn back that clock, we can't do it. So to prepare our students, I think we need to deal with this, but again, in a really careful way that, again, uh, was so big, so big. Yes, it is indeed huge. Yeah, Dana. No, I was just gonna add to that. So our department started talking about it um, in the fall, very early on. And we have faculty members all on the spectrum of, of thought and feels. <laughs> and it is all the way from, you know, I'm super excited, Heidi, you know, we, you know, we just, we need to get on this, we need to use it um, to where, uh, to the other side where faculty members are genuinely um, anxious, you know, uh, getting into, you know, this is what we do, especially for writing instructors, like this is our job. So what, what is going to come of my job? And so I think that for me personally and professional, I also have feels. We do have a plagiarism policy and we have added this to that plagiarism policy, just blanket, you know, uh, policy, logistics, that kind of thing. But I think also on the bigger picture, we as instructors really need to think about um, as we keep saying, this is a tool, but I, I kind of balk at the whole analogy of this being the new calculator, because as humans, we think in words. We think in words, we think in images. Unless we're really, really nerdy, I don't know, we don't think in numbers, <laughs> right? Mathematicians, we love you. <laughs> Sorry, but even they, think in words and images. And so, you know, thinking of this as a tool not to generate ideas, but hopefully to clarify and organize original ideas, that's what I'm that's what I'm after. Um, and I and we have to guide through students through that process of using a tool that way. So thank, thanks Dana. Heidi, do you want to weigh in on that? I have so many thoughts. Good. Um, seen students use ChatGPT in different ways. What I personally have told my students, and, and I'm really grateful that you brought up, uh, Shirsten, I'm confused between, Shirsten, okay. <laughs> uh, I'm really grateful that you brought that up because most of my students are going into nursing. And I've told them, you need to clarify with your instructors what is allowed in, in your, your usage. So I, I love that we're on the same page there. And I also think that giving students instruction about how they are allowed to use chat gpt so if i personally am okay with students taking their paper or a section of their paper and saying tell me how i can improve this not improve it for me so that's a very so i will tell them use terms like evaluate but do not rewrite mm. make suggestions but do not compose because I'm, I'm okay with, with chat GPT saying, you could use more examples of how a dog is friendly, but I'm not okay with chat GPT saying, these are examples of how a dog is friendly. Does that make sense? And so yeah. I think giving students specific instruction in the ethical and the effective use of chat GPT is going to become part of my job as a writing teacher. And, and then the other thing is, Dana is exactly right. I too bulk at the, because I have never put an equation into a calculator and then been reprimanded for putting that equation in, right? But right. chat GPT, kind of a humorous example. I saw a writing assignment um, using Toolman argument to argue that Tupac was still alive. I thought that's really fun. So I put it into chat GPT and I was lectured on questioning the established narrative of a local government. It, it not only wow. did it refuse, yeah, not only did oh, it refuse. Oh, hi, Heidi, I, I'm so sorry, I'm an energy. What, 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 how, what was the reprimand? And go, go ahead and finish your thought. And then I want to know what the reprimand, reprimand was. Um, it told me that it was dangerous to, wow. so we really need to be telling students to address this critically and with an extremely critical viewpoint. We have to teach them how to think independently. And it's it's exciting, but it's also dangerous because it sounds so authoritative and so official. And yet it is telling people how and what to think. 
and we need to address that. We, I think as educators, we need to be at the forefront of addressing that for both their future as employees and their future as citizens. Heidi, such a great point. Thank you so much. Shearston. I was just going to say along those lines, like two of the things that I keep hearing about, like concerns with chat GPT is, you know, all it does is it analyzes the data it has and like, where is it getting the data? It's getting it from the internet. And some of the data on the internet isn't great. And it tends, you know, it talks about how, you know, AIs can be very misogynistic and all of the those other problems that get in because it's just all it has is the data it's given. So right. it's an imperfect tool. It can be a great tool, but it's a really imperfect tool. D Dana, please. Thank you, Shirsten. No, absolutely. I mean, where did where did that information originally come from? All the information originally came from humans. <laughs> and the humans make the mistakes all the time. And so that I mean, I, I completely agree. Like we we cannot take this information as good as it sounds, and like Heidi says, as authoritative as it sounds, as truth. You know, and we're we're dealing with that all around us anyway, especially in educational settings and and critical thinking. Um, and so I think that's actually a fun a fun thing that we can we can do with our students. Like, oh, do you really want to use this? Just point blank, you know. And you have to you have to know what to input, right, to get the output that you want. So it's kind of it, when i was teaching eight years ago i used to have a whole you know, I'm a, i was a history instructor and uh would ha began having a whole unit on what constitutes evidence so is chat gpt actually evidence and shearston i think you had a comment you wanted to make i would say it's not really evidence because from my understanding for one thing it's a liar <laughs> um so so when we, I went to the BSU, um, there was a BSU online group that right. talked about this, like by BSU, and and the person leading my little mini group put in a, a question that she happened to have done her like doctoral thesis on. So she knew really well, but it was kind of like, you know, really out there, not very many people read it. And she said like, and it actually did get it right that time, but she said she'd done it in the past and it totally lied. But it, it was a believable lie. Wow. Uh, so it like told this like story that like just did not exist and wasn't true. But it, it's a liar. You can't believe what it says all the time. <laughs> all right. You heard it here first from Shearston. Chat GPT is a liar. All right. Well, we are 20 minutes into our um, discussion and we've gotten through one of my, I don't know, I have a lot of questions just because I didn't want to run out of I, how I thought we would run out of uh, things to talk about. I don't know. So let's just. Um, move on. So we've talked a little bit about this, but let's delve a, a bit more into what, what would be the benefits. So we've talked about some of the things that we need to be very aware of that, first of all, it's a liar, but then other things as well. So um, what are the benefits of incorporating um, chat GPT into the community college experience? Could it help with collaborative learning? Uh, could it be really a benefit to students with disability? And could it also help with some of the flexible learning styles that students might need? So I'll let whoever wants to launch into that, take that question. Dana. Yeah, I just have a couple of thoughts about that, kind of going back to um, what I was talking about earlier. Um, especially students who have disabilities concerning language. I, I do think that it can be very helpful. Again, there's, there's so much work that has to go um, to creating that framework so that it will be successful and actually helpful. But, you know, I, I kind of think about our, um, you know, like grammar AI, right? So we, grammarly.com, you know, things like that. Um, and communication and language has changed so fast and is changing so quickly, including what is correct, right? And I know I personally use Grammarly.com. I encourage my students to use Grammarly.com or something similar because the expectations of output are greater than the time that I have to make sure I'm putting my comma in, in the right place. And so, thinking about that and kind of translating it to this this bigger you know idea um 
or this bigger concept of actually generating ideas, I think it's important to um, use it to help students clear up and organize their ideas and their language. And so that's how I think, you know, we can, we can really use it to, to help specific students who might struggle with language and also who might not. Um, yeah, clarity and cohesion is difficult. It's, it's difficult to articulate our ideas. So. Uh, Dana, thank you. That was beautifully stated. So Shearston or Heidi, do you want to piggyback on that? Yeah, I, I think that Dana's spot on that it can help people who struggle with language. In fact, I have a couple students, one of the best interventions for people who just, English is their native language, but they just struggle with, like Dana said, that clarity and cohesion. One of the best interventions is to read widely from text that models clarity and cohesion. And so I have a couple of students where I have recommended to them, you know, spend some time talking to, Jet, to chat GPT. Have a conversation about whatever you want to talk about because you will be engaging with very well modeled language. That's what it is. It's a language generator. And so I think there's also a lot of potential there. And That's really great. Yeah, go ahead, Shirsten, please. I was going to say, and really, I mean, we all learn to do things by feedback. And if that feedback is by an AI versus an in person, so long as we're learning, um, I think that the concern is that the AI does it and then you don't review it, you just hand it in, um, which is a real concern. But like, if, if there would be a way to like walk them through it, like explain why you made these changes based on the AI and, and, and have them go through the process, I think that could be a strong tool. Because again, like I, I don't know, I'm sure um, Dana and Heidi and you were, were, were born really good writers, but I wasn't. And I became an adequate writer because people gave me a lot of feedback over time. Um, and it's just, if that's another tool we can do to get them that feedback, that could be really helpful. Yeah, that's really, really excellent points. Uh, thank you so much. So, um, and how do you think chat GPT might actually help faculty, maybe in the realm of data analytics, for instance, do you think that faculty might be able to use it to collect, analyze data on student performance or help instructors make informed decisions about teaching methods? Um, what, what, what do you guys think about that about from it from that faculty viewpoint using chat GPT? I think that I expect that there will be artificial intelligence programs that are designed specifically to analyze student data and make suggestions. As far as how ChatGPT does it, I have tried that. I've tried putting in uh, the range of the grades and getting some feedback on what, what does this indicate about how the class is performing, about how the class is functioning. And it did have some suggestions. They were fairly generic and not super specific, but I definitely can see AI moving in that direction and I think it could be very useful. I think again, it's. I think you're right. It's all about the information it has. So you have to put in the exact information you want. There's, there's um, one of our, my faculty. You like loves baseball and asked it to build like a fantasy baseball team um, for him. And it used the statistics it just gathered on its own. And he's like, it, it didn't do a great job. But then once he gave it like the statistics he wanted it to look at, then it could like really, really kind of knock it knock it out of the ballpark because I'm going to follow with that sports theme. Um, so it really is. It's like a tool. And if we're giving it the right information, it should be able to give us some good answers and help us analyze some things, I think. I'll jump in here. I, I, I know, not me personally, <laughs> teachers are using AI for lesson planning. Right. You know, and so that's one way, again, you know, ethically, um, you know, we need all the tools, but what does that really mean? We don't right. know, this, you know, um, but I do um, think that we, you know, um, sorry, I just lost, lost my train of thought. <laughs> I, I do that all the time. So take your time. <laughs> so 
Um, tell me what we're thinking about. I'm so sorry. <laughs> So just about analyzing student student performance using it as a data analytics tool, basically. Thank you so much. I'm so sorry. Yeah, so no, you're great. My main point is I hope, I'm hoping that our uh, learning management systems, our LMSs, are going to be working with these companies. I think we're going to see more and more of these AI language companies, um, you know, come out of nowhere. And so I really do. I hope that we can use the, the platforms and the software and the programs that we already have and use that for the power of good by, um, you know, using them together to, to really be able to analyze student data. I think there's great potential for that. Great. Thanks, Dana. Shearston. And you, you had already said, Lori, like this is not actually new. I mean, AI has right. been around forever. So like in, in the nursing program, we use, um, something called ATI, and a student will take a test and it'll analyze it and say, these are your areas of weakness. This is what you need to study to get stronger at it. And so it's already it's already there and we've already been working at it. If that could get even better with time to really help those students hone in on weaknesses, I think that could be a huge tool that could help the students. For, for sure. And all, I mean, we've been, you know, every time we ask Siri to do something for us or um, President Amon often talks about, you know, the first time some, you use GPS, we probably all remember when we use GPS for the first time. All of that's artificial intelligence. So there's so much buzz, buzz around chat GPT because I think it just, it elevated AI very quickly and I think much, much more quickly than scientists thought that something like that would be available that is so quick to just spit out information. So with that, I'm gonna to go to this next question of what ethical guidelines should be established to govern the use of chat GPT in the classroom? And we've touched on this a bit, but I wanna go down that rabbit hole a little bit more. Uh, should there be ethics for, or should there be guidelines for ethical use in the classroom? And what might that look like? And how do we then enforce that? Lots of big questions here. Dana. I'm just, I'm gonna jump in before I forget. Yeah, oh good. <laughs> so I, I am, this is what I am most fascinated about. And I'm imagining that we're going to have thousands and thousands of dissertations about this, <laughs> right? Um, and it's the same thing that we deal with when talking about plagiarism, right? And so, and then just like Shearston was talking about earlier, um, we don't, talking about citing, my MLA guidebook does not tell me how to cite chat gpt yet right. that it will i bet it will well and so we are figuring all of these things out but i i think it is common knowledge that we're going to have to we we have to say um you cannot just use somebody else's ideas even if it's a you know conglomeration of a, so many people's ideas or images artwork whatever creativity um that you're gonna have to somehow say that it was not completely yours um, but what that looks like is going to be really interesting, I think. Yeah. Very good comments, Dana. Heidi or Shearston? Please, Heidi. Um, I definitely agree with Dana. I think attribution needs to be given. APA, the online, does have a way to cite ChatGPT. And okay. I've already begun modeling that for my students. If I used ChatGPT to help me generate an assignment description or a rubric, I cite it in my source, because I think one of the things that came up when I was reading Chronicle of Higher Education is that as teachers, we also have the onus of transparency when it comes to our use of artificial intelligence. And so if we expect our students to cite it, we need to cite it. If we expect them to disclose that they have used uh, artificial intelligence to help them compose a paper, then we have to disclose that we're gonna be using artificial intelligence to detect the extent to which they use artificial intelligence to compose their paper. Does that make sense? Oh, yes. And so I think ethically, it's going to be very teacher led. And, and I don't think the students that I've had that misused chat GPT, I truly believe they did not mean to misuse it. Okay. And so there was one class where I knew it was going to be a potential issue. I addressed it. I discussed it in depth. I've had no problems. There was another class where I didn't think anyone, it would be an issue at all. And I ended up, I did have some education that I had to give because I had not addressed it up front. So, so I think. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Heidi. I'm sorry. I, I'm done. 
Well, so I would, so you said it wasn't a problem at all. So I want to just um, press on that a little bit. How did you know it wasn't a problem? How did you know that they hadn't used chat GPT? Because I can spot it. I've used chat GPT enough that I, I can tell when a text has been generated by chat GPT and, and I do use, um, or I have used detectors to see if, if it was, and, and the students have written in the class that I addressed, they've used authentic papers. And the class that I didn't address it, there was one paper that I, within 15 seconds, okay. I said this, this was written, this language was produced by ChatGPT. It turned out it was the student's idea and they thought that running it through ChatGPT was the same thing as going to the writing center. So education was in order and that's how I learned, I need to be actively educating about this in every class, not just the ones where I know it's gonna be an issue. Well, oh, it does. And hey, I'll just say this and Shearston, I, I think you might want to jump in. So I, I would think that by the end of the semester, I would be able to to tell in, in a history class just because I know the students writing style by then. There's so much writing. But at the beginning of the semester, I'm not so sure. And maybe I just need to engage with chat more. At the beginning of the semester, not knowing the student, I'm not sure I would know if they had used it or not. And then the second thing I wanted to, to talk about, and maybe this is going down a different direction and we can just kind of leave it there. I have often wondered that if I have an idea for a great book or a movie or something, but it's my idea and I do some inputs into chat GPT about my idea, give it some, a little bit of parameters, but then chat GPT writes it, who owns, and it goes on to be like a Harry Potter, you know, Billy, I don't know, Billy, millions of dollars. Who actually owns the copyright to that? And you touched on that a little bit that your student said, it's my idea. I just ran it through chat GPT. I thought that was fine. So, all, so so many questions to be answered, I think. Uh, Shearston, did you want to weigh in on that? I'm probably just adding to what um, Heidi and Dana said. I mean, just really clear expectations. I for sure am going to include a syllabus blurb specifically on AI for my next um, semester of teaching. Um, again, like in nursing, we're really collaborative. We expect our students to like interact with each other a lot. So, but so we've had to develop a syllabus blurb that says, you know, assume it's an individual assignment unless we tell you it's a group assignment, just because we want to avoid that confusion. So now it's going to include something that says, assume that you can't use chat GP, GPT slash AI unless we tell you you can use um, you can use it. So just that really clear communication because the the students that I know that have done it, it, again, like I can, when you hear their stories, like it's because people they've trusted have like said, no, it's fine. Sometimes it's like, sometimes it is like the high school teachers or the middle school teachers. Sometimes it's family members that say, I've always, you know, I've been doing this like all semester and it's been fine. And it's just, it, it is education and clear expectations. Fantastic. So what, what training resources should we be thinking about or developing specifically for faculty, faculty and staff, so they're equipped to effectively use ChatGPT and not, not only uh, not only to, to educate students, but for themselves as well. What, what, what might that look like? Do you guys have thoughts on that? Everybody does. Yay. I knew you ladies would. Okay. So somebody take, take away, take it away. Heidi. I would say transparency and specificity. So we need to be training students and faculty in how to be very transparent in how and to what extent they used AI. And we need to train people in what kinds of prompts are going to produce ethical and effective feedback. So what specific words and prompts does a student use to get, this is how you can improve your paper, and what words should they avoid so that ChatGPT doesn't just start spitting out a paper that they then can't use because it's not their material. So right. I think training in specific prompts, I think, is going to be part of that. So and I'm training to how to properly document it. For sure. And uh, President Amon did, I, he did a couple of weeks ago, a uh, chat GPT for, for not so much from the academic standpoint, but for staff and talked a lot about the prompts and how important that prompt is um, when you're utilizing chat GPT. So Dana and Shearston. No, Heidi stole mine. <laughs> <laughs> that one second is so hard. It really is. 
<laughs> it really is. Um, but I've been going first a lot, so I'm okay with it. No, absolutely. I think that that's, that's really smart. I think um, for me, though, things are changing so quickly yeah. that we don't know yet. We don't know what training we need yet. And the training we might need today might be different in two months. Dana, I think that's spot on because right after ChatGPT was launched in November, and I alluded to this earlier in the conversation, right after it was launched, uh, institutions immediately came out with guidelines. And now those guidelines are completely wrong, obsolete, that they've changed. You know, I, some, some major colleges have gone through like three iterations of here are guidelines for using ChatGPT. So I think that's a, a really good point. Shearston. I was going to say, as far as training faculty on how to use it, um, I asked ChatGPT and they said that learning is enhanced in tropical climates in the wintertime. Oh, so I'm just like throwing that out there. Oh, as a, okay. as a I think I need to check your source there, Kirsten. <laughs> ChatGPT is a liar, though. Okay. That is the takeaway from Shearston of the day. So um, any other thoughts on training? I mean, do you think that it would be beneficial for, so you see going across, scrolling across the screen for the viewers and for um, the guests on the show today, I will be launching a chat GPT task force to continue this conversation, this dialogue. But as we think about, as we launch into that task force, and I think all three of you are going to be on that task force, um, sh should we think about trying to develop training or is it just so far out of our scope or would it, what, what do you think about that? I think it would be really helpful for me to have training. Again, I am not the most tech savvy person. Um, and they're like, I really want to get in there and learn about it, but I also want to and need to learn about a bunch of other things. So it'd be nice if, right. if someone spoon fed me that information, that would be super helpful. And I would assume that most faculty would feel the same way. So yeah, I think a lot of training would be nice. And Shirsten, I think we need to work on like trust issues with chat GPT for you as well. So we'll, we'll have that as part of the training. So Dana or Heidi, any other thoughts on that? You know, I was just gonna yeah say that basically the same thing is that just because we know it might be changing, anything we can get is going to be helpful right now. Heidi, any any additional thoughts? I think they're both very wise and I agree with everything they said. Okay. Thank you so much. So, uh, you know, I've, I, and, and we've touched on this a bit. Oh, and let me say to the viewers, if you have questions, um, you can put them in the chat and Emma will uh, uh, give those questions to us. Also, if you just have some comments or thoughts that you would like for us to um, discuss or mention, um, I'll be happy to do that. So uh, we, we, we have about uh, five, set, five to seven minutes left in the broadcast today. So I've read and listened to a lot of podcasts, read a, I've read a lot of articles, listened to a lot of podcasts on um, chat GPT. There are certainly doomsdayers who say this is the end of the world. I mean, literally, I listened to a physicist from MIT who is a professor of AI, he's been researching AI, and he says this is just the end of the world as we know it. Um, then there are also those that say there, it is just a, it, it's it's going to be a transformative tool and it's going to change the world for the better, um, giving access, opportunity, equity to more people. Where do you fall on the spectrum and why? And I know we've touched on it a bit, but let's go just a little bit deeper into that with the three of you. Shearston, why don't we start with you? So, uh, like, I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one that's ever made this comparison, and I'm sure I'm actually ripping this off of someone else that I listened to on some podcast somewhere. But, I mean, the Industrial Revolution was the end of the world, too. Correct. Right. And, and it was kind of the end of a world, but people adapted and a lot of things got better and... The same, I, I mean, the same thing's going to happen. It, are a lot of things going to change? Yes. Are a lot of jobs going to change? Yes. Does that mean that the computers are going to take over the world? I don't think so. Um, I just think we'll learn how to use them better. Great. Dana. No, absolutely. Sorry about that. Absolutely. I think um, for me personally and professionally, I'm, I'm a little more towards the, the transformational side just because that's naturally how I think um, and how I operate. 
Um, but I understand. I really do get it. Like this is this is new stuff. This is new territory. And kind of going back to that whole, um, we are dealing with language here, which is the basis of communication for human beings. And so it is scary to think that that's being messed with, um, you know. And so I get it. But but I I am trying to be positive, <laughs> you know, and trying to really really think through. Uh, the transformation pieces um, and potential of those. Okay. Heidi. I would piggyback onto what Dana said. Uh, communication, it's, it's dealing with communication, which is the basis of how humans communicate, but it's also the basis of how humans think. And that is something that I think we need to preserve. So I'm very excited about AI because like Dana, that's just my personality. I'm an optimizer, I'm a pusher. You give me new technology and I'm gonna push it to the max to see how it can improve my life. But we need to make sure that it is actually improving our lives and improving the way our students think and improving the way our students can be employed and that it's not taking over the way they think. And I, I feel like that's going to be a really vital component of what I do as a, as a humanities and a language teacher is going to be preserving and augmenting the way students can think and not allowing it to become replaced because it's it's pretty powerful stuff. Very, Shearson. Yes, thank you, Heidi. That was beautifully put, by the way. Thank you. So, and this is like maybe way, okay, it's definitely beyond the scope of this, but I find it really interesting. I, I was reading one paper and it talked about the ethical principles that need to guide AI. And, and, you know, again, it goes into the data that it's given, like, like, how can we make sure the data it's given is good? And then like the algorithms that, that create the information, the that there should be transparency. I had listened to something and it described um, some of these AIs as black boxes, because the people that built it know what those algorithms is, are and how they made those decisions. But unless that's a transparent, how how do you make sure that the decisions it's making are not fatally flawed? Um, and it's just, I don't know, AI is so interesting and big. It, it is interesting and big. So what I'm hearing is that you guys are cautious optimists about chat GPT, but we need to be really, really careful um, as we move forward. So it's interesting. This is not original with me. It was in one of the podcasts that I listened to. Somebody said that, um, that when the alphabet was first introduced, that people also thought philosophers, educators of the time, you know, long time ago said, this is the end of critical thinking. This is the end of creativity because now all you're going to have to do is just read something and you're not going to have to actually create it yourself. So I realize this is much bigger than an alphabet, but it's, it, that was also an interesting analogy, you know, going a bit beyond the calculator analogy of that the alphabet was going to be the end of the world and critical thinking as well. So uh, as we just have, we have about a few more minutes, uh, what, what are some kind of closing thoughts that you would have about as we think about moving into this brave new world, as we think about launching our task force, what are some of your last thoughts um, for the listening community today? And Heidi, why don't we start with you? I think collaboration is going to be really huge. So I, I'm so excited that Shearson is here. I think it's going to be really important to have interdepartmental, as well as um, conversations with high school teachers and employers to find out what are their expectations regarding how our students emerge from CEI interacting with ChatGPT. What are their expectations regarding the ethics? What are their expectations regarding their skill level? So that we can incorporate that effectively. So I think communication and collaborative learning is going to be really vital. Thank you so much, Heidi. Dana? No, absolutely. I completely agree with Heidi. Um, I think this is cliche, but you know, education is power. And so if we can stay on top of knowing what we're dealing with, and that means as humans doing the research, sharing the knowledge, especially as um, you know, college faculty and, and uh, personnel, then that's, that's really, I think our, our, you know, best superpower is, is really just trying to understand the small and the big, and having those conversations with each other and with our students too. That was beautiful, Dana and Heidi. Thank you so much. Shearston. I think
think I echo what both of them said, those collaborations both in, in the school and in like our surrounding schools that feed into us. So we're all on the same page is huge. And additionally, the collaboration to the employment sector beyond us for what they're going to be using it as and maybe what we need to prepare our students for. Um, is, I think those are the things we should be talking about. Wow, you guys, that, that those were all amazing closing comments. Uh, let me extend my thanks to you once again. I know you're very busy. Thank you for engaging in this conversation, just beginning the conversation on our campus. And for anybody who would like to be part of the chat GPT task force that will be starting after graduation, um, you can send me an email. It's up there on the screen. And Amanda Logan sent me an article as she knew I was preparing for this. And one of the um, what, there was a quote in there that is so good that I think it might be good to close out uh, this um, conversation with. And it said, uh, rather than trying to outsmart AI, our job as educators is to educate and empower principled creators. And honestly, I think that's what all of you were talking about today. Uh, so once again, thank you so much for your time. And I look forward to engaging with you all more on this in our task force. Um, CEI community, thanks so much. And President Amon will be back next week. I believe he's going to have Senator Lent as his guest. So uh, thank you so much and have a great week.